welcome. I am Julia Baird and it is my enormous pleasure to host this video to celebrate the results of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize, the most significant genre-based prize in Australia and New Zealand. The winners of the two categories of the prize will be announced live at the end of the video during the Historical Novel Society Australasia Virtual Conference Cocktail Party. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land right throughout Australia, as well as recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present, as well as those emerging. And to the people of New Zealand, I sincerely say tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato katora. In just its second year of operation, the ARA Historical Novel Prize is now worth a total of $100,000 in prize monies, with the addition of the children and young adult category this year. The prize will award $50,000 to the adult category winner with an additional $5,000 to be awarded to each of the remaining two shortlisted authors. In the CYA category, the winner will receive $30,000, while the two shortlisters will receive $5,000 each. This prize is the result of a shared vision, and that's one between the Historical Novel Society Australasia and Edward Federman, Managing Director of the ARA Group. Together, they've raised the profile of the genre and also enabled historical novelists to be recognised and rewarded in a class that's just of their own. I'd now like to welcome the Chair of the Historical Novel Society Australasia, Elizabeth Storrs, to tell you more about the HNSA as well as the value of historical fiction. The Historical Novel Society Australasia was established to promote the reading, writing and publication of historical fiction in our region. It's also the third arm of the International Historical Novel Society. And at this year's virtual biennial conference, we'll feature over 90 fantastic historical novelists from across the world. The introduction of the ARA Historical Novel Prize in 2020 enabled the HNSA to raise the profile of the genre to an entirely new level. We are immensely grateful for the generous patronage of Edward Federman and the ARA Group for making the prize possible. This has provided a real opportunity for us to foster the genre on a grander scale and now encourage younger readers with the introduction of the CYA category this year. Historical fiction provides enlightenment, entertainment and a chance to escape. Tales from the past also give a chance to recover lost, overlooked or deliberately erased histories and can play a part in achieving truth in reconciliation by challenging history previously considered set in stone. This year's shortlists explore a diverse range of powerful themes, from recognising the silent victims of war and the uncomfortable truths of colonialism, through to stories of love, loss and belonging, as well as messages of hope and beauty. And some of the CYA novels blend magic, mystery and fantasy into the mix. The shortlists demonstrate that seamless prose, unforgettable characters, meticulous research and epic storytelling produce the best historical fiction. Our gratitude is extended to our dedicated judges to whom Julia will introduce you. An enormous thanks to the New England Writers Centre for administering the entries. I'm thrilled the winners will be announced at the HNSA Virtual Cocktail Party, where we'll truly celebrate making a noise about historical fiction. The novels and authors long listed for the adult category of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize are The Tolstoy Estate by Stephen Conte A Room Made of Leaves by Kate Grenville The Last Convict by Anthony Hill The Glass Harpoon by Robert Horn The Mad Woman's Coat by Ian Reid the Silent Listener by Lynn Yeowert. The novels and authors long listed for the CYA category of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize are The Boy Who Stepped Through Time by Anna Sidor, Night Ride Into Danger by Jackie French, 
Heroes of the Secret Underground by Suzanne Gervais. The Detective's Guide to Ocean Travel by Nikki Greenberg. Echo in the Memory by Cameron Nunn. Harmony by Richard Yaxley. Now let's hear from Edward Federman from the ARA Group to hear his reasons for sponsoring the prize and expanding the award to include a children and young adult category. Thank you, Julia. With great pride, we are celebrating the second annual ARA Historical Novel Prize. The ARA Historical Novel Prize celebrates an underappreciated genre of literature. In its inaugural year, with only one award category, there was a huge response to the prize with more than 180 entries. As a result of the interest in the ARA Historical Prize specifically, and the historical fiction genre generally, the prize has been expanded to include a children and young adult category alongside the adult category. ARA has increased the total prize money from $60,000 in the prior year to $100,000 for this year's prizes. The level of prize money makes the ARA Historical Novel Prize the richest genre-based literary prize in Australasia. A significant amount of work is required by many people to ensure the success of this literary prize. First and foremost, I want to thank Elizabeth Storrs, Chair of the Historical Novel Society Australasia, ARA's partner in this endeavor. The dedication of the HNSA's team has been invaluable. Without the work of the judges in both categories, there would be no literary prize. Heartfelt thanks to Nicole Alexander, chair of the adult category, and her team of judges. Likewise, sincere thanks to Paul McDonald, chair of the children and young adult category, and his team of judges. The judges had an enormous amount of reading to do to whittle down entries to the long list, and then had a very difficult job to do to determine the short list and eventually the winners. I have read all of the long-listed adult books, and they are all exceptional novels. We are blessed with talented writers in Australia and New Zealand. The importance of literary prizes and the monetary rewards that support our very best novelists cannot be overstated, especially in these challenging times. ARA has a consistent history of supporting literature and the arts. The ARA Historical Novel Prize is an important element of ARA's commitment to literature in our region of the world. Chosen from the 18 long-listed books, congratulations are extended to the six authors shortlisted across the two categories of the prize. They are Anita Heiss for Billa Yaru Dungalangdare, River of Dreams, published by Simon & Schuster. Gail Jones for Our Shadows, published by Text Publishing. Jock Sarong for The Burning Island, published by Text Publishing. And for the children and young adult category, Amelia Mellor for The Grandest Bookshop in the World, published by Affirm Press. Katrina Nanestad for We Are Wolves, published by HarperCollins Australia. Pamela Rushby for The Mummy Smugglers of Crumblin Castle, published by Walker Books Australia. The three members of the judging panel for the adult category of the prize were Panel Chair Nicole Alexander, author of 10 best-selling historical novels. Her debut novel was shortlisted for an Australian Book Industry Award and she holds a Master of Letters in Creative Writing and Literature. Carmel Bird, author of more than 30 books spanning fiction, non-fiction and anthologies. Three of her novels have been shortlisted for the Miles Franklin Literary Award and she was the 2016 winner of the Patrick White Literary Award. Rowana Gonsalves, award-winning author of The Permanent Resident. She is a recipient of the Prime Minister's Australia Asia Endeavour Award and the Bridge Awards inaugural Veruna Cove Park Writing Residency in Scotland. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the Chair of the Adult Judging Panel, Nicole Alexander. What an honour it has been to be a judge for this year's ARA Historical Novel Prize. This important prize recognises a significant literary genre, one that celebrates, enlightens and interprets, and most importantly, allows us to escape into new unknown worlds and for the briefest of moments, discover what it may have been like to live in another age. 
I would like to thank my fellow judges, Carmel Bird and Roanna Gonsalves. It is extraordinarily exciting to see the calibre of historical fiction being published in Australia and New Zealand. We received 95 entries this year and the breadth of the narratives made for fascinating reading. We were transported around the globe, thrust into theatres of war, held spellbound by loves lost and found, left breathless by the frailty of life and pulled headlong into the realities of human machination and depravity. The quality of entries was very high, making the judging an extremely difficult task. The judging was based on three key criteria, excellence in writing, depth of research, and reader appeal. If a book did not meet the first criteria, excellence in writing, it was set aside. This year's three shortlisted titles stood out from a very fine long list. And for the purpose of this video, each judge was allocated one of the books and asked to provide a quote to accompany an illustrated reading. The 2021 shortlisted titles probe into time and place and through a blend of fact and imagination offer compelling portraits of racism, love, identity, dispossession, greed and dysfunction. They make us question the very tenets of civilization and they do so with grace and beauty, deftly reminding us that the past can follow us into the present, guiding us, haunting us, and leading us to question our own place in today's world. Congratulations, Anita Heiss, Jock Sarong, and Gail Jones. To mark this very special occasion, please enjoy our adult category shortlisted authors reading an excerpt from their novel, along with a quote about their work from one of the judges. Louisa looks hurt, disappointed. Neither of the women know where to turn as if looking at each other would be even more unsettling. But while Wagadine wants Louisa to understand what she is trying to explain, the last thing she wants to do is hurt her feelings. She is, after all, the only person she has to lean on here in Wagga Wagga. She's beginning to realise that Louisa needs her too, not just to help around the house, but as emotional support since she has no other female companionship. In the uncomfortable silence, Wagadine bends over and picks up the broom. She looks at it for a moment, considers its long handle and smiles, having found a way to explain what she has been trying to express to Louisa. She will try one more time. Touch this, she says to Louisa, who looks perplexed. Go on, touch it, please. Louisa runs her hand along the upper length of the broom handle. What is it made of? Louisa frowns. Wood, of course. Yes, Wobbledine agrees. And where does wood come from? Well, she looks at Wobbledine suspiciously. It comes from trees. Wobbledine can hear the frustration in Louisa's voice at having to answer such basic questions. So the handle is made of wood and wood comes from trees. And so you could say that this handle is a tree in a different form. Louisa considers the words, looks at the broom handle, touches it again. She then looks back at Wobbadine. The tree hasn't really changed, Louisa. It's just in a different form. Louisa nods. I am the tree, Louisa. I'm still the same, just a bit different here because of how I live. But that hasn't changed who I am inside, who I am as a person. I am still the Wobbadine I was the day you met me and for all the years before you met me and I will be me for all the days ahead just as her father had said she would be. Dispossession, love and language centre this story of a young Riadri woman indentured to a white household and mourning the separation from her family. I skillfully explores the devastating impact of colonial law through the difficult relationship that develops between Wagadine and the Quaker wife of her employer. The calm, insightful narrative underscores the many abuses of racism and colonialism. Displacement and the gradual loss of identity 
where even language is stolen, is beautifully weighted against Wagadine's love for the stockman Yin Jamara, leading us to question what it is to be a moral being. The calm, insightful prose underscores the many injustices of racism and colonialism. Displacement and the gradual loss of identity, where even language is stolen, is beautifully weighted against Wagadine's love for the stockman Yin Jamara, making us question what it is to be a moral being. Through language and a palpable love for her people and country, Heist gives voice to those silenced and takes back what was lost to the white narratives of colonialization. He'd seen the fellowship of miners, the way poor men of many nations found a community underground, carving shafts and tunnels, setting charges and drilling and exploding the earth timbering, hauling, filling and winching the kibbles. In those days, there were still wooden poppet heads everywhere, stories of seams that shone like sunshine and men stealing nuggets in their cheeks and shoes. The bosses took the money, but for some reason the work still appealed. The superhuman experience of sinking miles down into the planet, following a light on your head, like a deep sea fish, into places few others had ever seen. They were a shoal together, comrades together, slow moving in a flow. Their carbide lights wavered solid rocks into water. Tunnel glisten and light flitter appeared submarine. At night classes at the School of Mines, Fred studied nitroglycerin explosives, handling and blasting. He passed his exams. The trick was to locate the boreholes, watch for faulty fuses, taking care with the detonators not to under or overcharge. Fred trained to be the one that set the charge. He learned about misfirings and noxious fumes. He learned that the detonators contained poisons, fulminate of mercury. He learned that one of the most dangerous things was leaving an unexploded plug in the rock. A bloke might drill into it and be blown to kingdom come. If it went with the ore to the surface, it could explode men and machinery up there. Fred Kelly became a quiet and cautious man. There was respect in his job, but responsibility too. He had nightmares about mates walking back into the cloud and fumes too soon being engulfed in a cloudy death and not coming out again. Gusts of cyanide, sulfur, carbon monoxide, arsenic. He knew them all. He knew exactly how a cloudy death might smell. In 1893, gold was found in Western Australia, which of course was good luck for some. But the life of the main character of the novel, 20th century orphan Francis Kelly, is a tale of bad luck. Frances ponders the elusive identity of her missing father as the narrative moves back and forth in time, mining the darkness of the past, searching for a glint of truth. Through a century of wars and other disasters, waves of fiction and non-fiction rise, fall, fracture, merge to present a terrifying and unnerving version of a whole world in crisis. Gail Jones excels in the poetic evocation of the most violent misery and abject suffering. She places moments of touching grace alongside episodes of horror as well as ugly banality. The tale begins in Ireland among the simple sunshine of golden daffodils and then it takes the reader on a grim exploration of the many sorrowful faces of human greed. I waited several hours on my bed, trying to read by lamplight. I closed my eyes a while and opened them. There was no rush to visit the doctor. He would be working his secret rituals throughout the night, impervious to time and fatigue. I was restless, I went above. The night was glorious, clear and still. I thought I was alone at first, the lines of the timbers and the rigging making silhouettes against the bright starlit sky. But then I saw that once again, Tarnora was out there too. She had been assigned poor Angus Connolly's hammock, but I'd never known her to use it. She seemed to live all her hours on deck. She was standing alone in the dark, one hand on the shrouds to steady her, looking up to the heavens. High beyond the tips of the masts, infinity stretched from horizon to horizon. 
Aside from the minor rocks that lay dark on the sea, we were suspended between two curving worlds, the stars above and the depths below. The surface was calm enough to reflect the galaxies so that it looked as though the universe swirled all around us, above and below, as if up and down had ceased to exist and only all around remained. The moonbird was aloft and freed of its own weight. And directly up there where Tarnora was looking, the Milky Way stretched across the sky, more detailed and vivid and terrifyingly vast than I had ever seen it. I dared not breathe for fear I might distract her, might break the trance of that moment and its eternal assurance that we and our cares and our tiny boat were nothing, a floating dust mote in the stillness. Looking down to the woman before me, I saw ceaseless motion. Her head twitched between points. And when it turned far enough, I could see that her eyes too were darting about. She was following movements. I couldn't see them, happenings, events. I did not know what. Like anyone else watching boxes or shoals of fish or children playing. Her face was reacting with fright, amusement, wonder and sorrow. Tiny changes, but unmistakable ones. Her free hand rose involuntarily once or twice as if something startled her. But for all my squinting and staring, I could see only the beautiful speckled stillness. She turned after a long time and strode directly to me. It was clear she knew I had been behind her all along. She looked into my eyes as few others can do and the stars lit her proud cheeks. Got made up there, she said to me. She pointed a finger into the heart of the Milky Way. Tuera made the sun and them stars made us and you lot never going to unmake us. Jock Sarong's The Burning Island is a captivating novel that makes the past come alive in an astonishing way. Sarong's luminous prose style conjures a world that is striking for the way it intertwines historical fidelity with imaginative exuberance. The story set in 1830 centers around 32-year-old Eliza Grayling and her father Joshua Grayling as they undertake a sea voyage around the Fano Islands in Bass Strait in search of an old enemy. Along the way, their journeys and their worldviews are irrevocably and satisfyingly challenged, particularly through the character of Taran O'Rara, who was a real-life warrior of the Tomajin people in Emu Bay. Nothing is as it seems in this luminous book. Sarong animates the characters and places in his novel with insightful attention to the hierarchies of desire and power, constantly surprising the reader right up until the last page. This is storytelling at its very best. Now let's turn to the children and young adult category. The three members of the judging panel for the prize were panel chair Paul McDonald, owner of the award-winning The Children's Bookshop. He is the winner of the 2012 Morris Saxby Award and the 2016 Lady Cutler Award for services to children's literature and literacy in Australia. Toy On, freelance arts journalist, critic and poet. She's also the books editor of The Big Issue. Her collection of poetry, Turbulence, was published in 2020. Catherine Mayo, award-winning New Zealand YA adult and children's writer with strong research interests in ancient Greece. She completed her BA as senior scholar in history. It is now my great pleasure to introduce the chair of the children and young adult judging panel, Paul McDonald. As judges, we spend a lot of time with the, the, the long list to actually come up with a short list was a really challenging task. And that's good news because the, the, the quality was exceptional. And certainly we found the three books we ultimately chose, the short list, were absolutely striking in their diversity. Those three books were The Grandest Bookshop in the World, The Mummy Smugglers of Crumblin Castle, and We Are Wolves. Each of those books ultimately were shortlisted because they demonstrated, I guess, three things. Excellence in writing. Each of them were beautifully written. Each of them demonstrated a depth of research. It is a historical prize. So obviously that's very significant. 
And what's a really important component is we, we had to judge that there would be widespread appeal as well. And we were very, very happy with the shortness of titles. The first of those titles, Amelia Miller's The Grandest Bookshop in the World, is an exceptional debut, really fresh. Um, it's a page turner. It's set in Melbourne in the late 1800s. What we loved about it, it offers a, both a dose of, of realism and also magic. So this nice combination to open the doors to the past um, with just fresh eyes. And there was the tone was, uh, there was this uh, delight, this gusto, which we just loved. The Mummy Smugglers of Crumbling Castle, there was no doubt that that was to be shortlisted. It's quirky, it's rollicking, um, fast paced. What we loved about this book is we wanted to step inside this book because we were transported to England in the late 1800s, hundreds, to um, some mummy unwrapping parties. I've never been to a mummy unwrapping party, but I wish I, I could go to one. Um, and then we got a chance to go along the Nile. It was um, beautifully written. And like the previous novel, Rushby actually employs a, a dose of realism and fantasy and weaves through the most strange and curious historical details. Our final title, We Are Wolves. Sadly for the children in this tale, there is no magic. It deals with the harsh realism of wool set in East Prussia at the end of World War II. Um, Nanestead, the author, highlights dislocated lies, but remembering her audience, she offers hope. Uh, and she offers hope uh, and a future, I guess, for those characters who we've come to love. Three novels shortlisted. We were very happy, happy that each of the novel, they do offer a window to the past, but as judges, we thought we also want to read books that resonate with readers today. Amelia Mellor, Pamela Rushby, Katrina Nanestead, our three authors have created stories that they do connect the past and the present. And ultimately, this year's shortlist unquestionably offers three compelling narratives, and they really encourage the reader to imagine, and I guess to reimagine the past. Please enjoy our CYA category shortlisted authors reading an excerpt from their novel, along with a quote about the work from one of the judges. The paper bird wagged its tail and dived. Pearl and Valley ran past the ornament department and down the staircase, footfalls like tumbling apples on the steps. A group of ladies gasped and clucked as the coals raced past them. They pelted down the next flight of stairs between Toyland and the perfumery and came out on the ground floor between Lollyland and the tea salon. Pearl jumped the last four steps. Valley was breathless. Where'd he go? A young man moved on, continuing his browsing, and behind him was the paper wagtail, staring at the coals with its empty white eyes. They ran across the arcade. The wagtail teased them, flitting first one way, then another, always just out of reach. It came to rest upon the big central display in the children's section. Pa's books were arranged on steps, like Japanese festival dolls. Joke books, educational books, and the ever popular funny picture book, which stood in pride of place. The crossed rainbows on its cover were as bright as ever against a black background. But as Pearl came nearer, she saw that it was not quite the same funny picture book as always. The words, which should have been as familiar as Pearl's own reflection, had changed and shifted into a new verse a sinister parody of the one her father printed on his covers. Each line was printed in a different colour of the rainbow. The famous rainbows of Cole's Book Arcade now count its final hours as they fade. In seven wondrous rooms you'll find a test to pass before the next can be addressed. All must be solved in time for you to win. Avoid, therefore, the snares that lurk within. As it began, it ends. Be good sports, if not friends. Based on the very real Coles Book Arcade in Melbourne, Amelia Mellor's debut was nonetheless a feat of imagination. Set in 1893, at the height of the Book Emporium's popularity, 
the novel uses the arcade's many array of delights as a bait for its story. Alongside the thousands of books, it had smartly dressed staff, a toy department, a sweet shop, tropical fernery, a tea salon, and a band. Into this busy, colourful environment, Mello introduces Pearl and Valley, children of Edward Cole, the owner of the grandest bookshop in the world. The Pearl and Valley did actually exist in real life. It's their fictional counterparts that drove Mello's book. When a trickster enters the scene, the kids realise that their father and his beloved bookshop are at risk. To reclaim them both, the siblings have to defeat seven challenges set by the stranger by midnight. The grandest bookshop in the world is an intricately detailed, fast-paced adventure tale of good and evil. One that pits the resourcefulness and ingenuity of children against the cunning greed of a character called the Obscura Smith. It's a gorgeous blend of realism and magic, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. A few people return to their homes, East Prussians who have fled but now creep back. Others move into houses and buildings that are not their own. They work for the Russians and grow vegetables and keep a few sickly animals. They are trying to rebuild their lives from nothing in a land that is no longer theirs. They do not have a scrap to spare for children living alone in the forest. We hide behind barns and when farmers go into their houses, we steal the slops from the pig troughs, the eggs from the nesting boxes. We break into kitchens and gobble whole pots of soup while the wife is outside doing the laundry. But even as we run from the house, curses being hurled at us from the clothesline, I tell myself we are just trying to survive. We are not wild, we are not wolves. Today we steal a hen, it's a Russian hen. We know it's Russian because as we run away from the barn, two Russian soldiers yell and shoot at us as we disappear into the forest. Real bullets whiz past our bodies. We laugh and scream and cry all at the same time as we run and dive into the deep dark undergrowth. We have become bold and brave, or bold and reckless, or maybe we have gone mad. I am so hungry, so desperate for meat that I wring the hen's neck before we get back to our camp and I don't even cry. Mia claps and shouts, Mia love chicken, yum. She is speaking so well and I'm proud of her words, but I'm also scared because being always hungry has made her heartless. It is the same for Otto and me. Food comes first. I roast the chicken over a fire and we eat it all. Bones, heart, lungs, kidneys, brain and feet. Chicken feet are delicious. Otto even eats the eyes. When we are done and we are lying on our greasy blankets beneath the summer sky, half naked in our torn clothes, our feet bare, their soles grown thick and tough from running about without boots, I remind Mia and Otto and myself once more, we are not wild, we are not wolves. When the German defences start collapsing towards the end of World War II, the Wolf family flees their home in East Prussia to escape the Russian army. Papa is already missing in action, and the three children must soon leave behind not only their opa and their oma, but even their mother. Alone, Liesl, Otto and baby Mia learn to live wild competing with thousands of other displaced war orphans who roam the forests and fringe farms of their defeated homeland. Sometimes they steal food and clothing. Sometimes they forage, barely surviving by killing and eating whatever small creatures they can find. Old norms and habits and morals are stripped away and Liesl's constant cry, we are not wolves, is increasingly an empty denial of the fact that they have become wolves in all but physiognomy. This is a simply and beautifully written, deeply moving account of survival. How much can you endure? It's also a testing of belief. Who and what can you trust? Can 12-year-old Liesl turn her back on the enormous propaganda machine of the German Reich? And it's a debate about identity. How much can you change and be changed 
and still be true to yourself. It is usually a distressing experience to be informed that a close relative has been eaten by a crocodile. But when Miss Fractious, the headmistress of Hattie's boarding school, sent for Hattie and told her she had some sad news regarding Hattie's guardian, her uncle, Sir Heracles Lampton, to impart, Hattie was able to remain tolerably composed. Departed, I fear, said Miss Fractious, proffering a handkerchief. Departed? Did Miss Fractious simply mean Uncle Heracles had gone off on his interminable travels again? Or might she possibly mean something more permanent? In any case, a handkerchief would not be necessary. Because, although her Uncle Heracles had been her guardian for 11 of her 12 years, Hattie had barely known him. He had always been away, travelling, shooting exotic animals and adding their stuffed heads to the extensive collection on the walls of Howling Hall, his large and gloomy house in the country. So, the guardianship now passes to your late uncle's own uncle and aunt, Miss Fraction went on, Sir Sisyphus Lambton and the Honourable Iphigenia Lambton. Hattie looked up, startled. I didn't know Uncle Heracles had an uncle and aunt. It seems he had, Miss Fractious approvingly. Your great uncle translates inscriptions, and your great aunt conducts um, mummy unwrapping parties. They have sent word you are to travel to their home. You mean I'm leaving school? Sir Sisyphus, I believe, intends to educate you himself. Miss Fractious sniffed again. He appears to be very surprised you have learned no Latin or Greek, or indeed any ancient Egyptian. Uh, where is it? Their home, I mean, asked Patty. Somewhere near Ely, I believe, in the Fens. The name of their home is Crumblin Castle. Crumblin Castle, Hattie thought. A great aunt who unwrapped mummies? It didn't sound much better than Howling Hall. It is usually a distressing experience to be informed that a close relative has been eaten by a crocodile. That first sentence just grabbed the three judges we were thrown straight into the book and it sets the tone for this quirky, rollicking tale of mummies, castles, crocodiles, villains and, and so much more. In fact, as reader, we're taken back to England in 1873 where a young orphan Hattie goes to live with his eccentric auntie and uncle. In fact, her aunt actually hosts these mummy unwrapping parties, which are just absolutely fascinating and delightful. Until the mummy supply runs out and the family have to set off on a perilous journey along the Nile, with some very unexpected consequences. This is absolutely a beautifully written book. It's impeccably researched. Don't be fooled by the humour. It's got so many details of this. It offers a fascinating exploration of Egyptian history, the mummification process, the place of hieroglyphs, and so much more. The novel also raises really interesting philosophical questions like it asks the young reader, should we actually be putting mummies on displays in museums? They are sacred objects. And there's a discussion around you know, really interesting issues like that. Rushby's text is beautifully illustrated by Nell May Pierce. I just wanted to mention that. And as judges, we thought The Mummy Smugglers of Crumbland Castle by Pamela Rushby was a certain shortlister and it's perfectly pitched for middle grade readers. Thank you all so much for joining us for this virtual event. I hope you enjoyed the introduction to our talented shortlisted authors and their outstanding novels. I'm now delighted to hand over to Elizabeth Storrs for the virtual broadcast of the announcement of the winners of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize. Thank you, Julia. We appreciate you presenting all our wonderful novelists and their books. Welcome all to the Historical Novel Society Australasia Virtual Cocktail Party. For the second year in a row, we haven't been able to gather together in one room to award the prize money, but we'll still connect with judges and authors across the ether 
to celebrate the historical fiction genre tonight. I'd now like to call upon our generous patron, Edward Federman, Executive Chair and Managing Director of the ARA Group to announce the winner of the adult category. Thanks, Elizabeth. It is my great pleasure for the ARA Group to be able to fund the $50,000 prize money to the winner of the adult category of the ARA Historical Novel Prize and $5,000 to each of the remaining shortlisted authors. We introduced the children and young adult category to this year's literary prize. $30,000 will be awarded to the winner of the CYA category, as well as $5,000 to the remaining shortlisted authors in this category. Each winner will receive a specially designed trophy made from Australian hardwood. The trophies were designed and handcrafted by Isao Takazawa, one of ARA's talented designers. And now, the moment you've been waiting for, the winner of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize is Jock Sarong, whose novel, The Burning Island, was published by Tex Publishing. Congratulations, Jock. And here is the virtual presentation of your trophy. While Jock gathers his thoughts, I will now hand over to Nicole Alexander, the chair of the adult category judging panel to give the judges report. Thank you very much, Ed, for that. I would like to thank Elizabeth Storrs and the HNSA committee for their dedication and our award patron, Ed Federman of the ARA group for his generous support. Historical fiction has been firmly thrust into the limelight. Thank you, Ed. The Burning Island is based on the true story of the 1839 disappearance of the Britomart, a ship that departed Melbourne for Hobart that never arrived. This richly imagined epic draws us into the colony of New South Wales in its infancy. Spinster Eliza Grayling reluctantly accompanies her blind alcoholic father on a sea voyage across the Bass Strait to find the missing ship and the man responsible for her loss. The reader is transported to the very fringes of civilization, where sealers operate across the Fenua Islands concealing their indigenous wives from those tasked with locating them and placing them in internment camps. Sarong's nuanced exploration of relations between European men and their Tarilal wives reflects a depth of research that sits effortlessly within a beautifully executed narrative. The skillful evoking of time and place captures a striking picture of shift and island life, as well as a vivid depiction of Tasmania's frontier wars. With unforgettable characters and themes of love, loyalty, survival and greed, we are presented with a most compelling portrait of human relationships, of the place of all women in society and the wickedness of the human soul. The Burning Island is simply an extraordinarily written story of adventure, mystery and revenge with, I must say, a brilliant finale. The judge's decision was unanimous. Congratulations to Jock Sarong. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce Jock Sarong, winner of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize Adult Category. Congratulations, Jock, well done. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm just so thrilled to have won this award. Uh, it's no small thing at all um, for somebody to put such a gesture of faith behind history writing in this country and in this region. Um, and I'd like to say thanks to you, Nicole, and, and to your fellow judges, Rowanna and Carmel Bird, um, and to the ARA group, and in particular to Edward Federman, Gail Jones and Anita Heiss. I want to say that I read both of your novels and that I loved them. Um, those being, of course, Our Shadows and Billy Yaradanga Langdure. And yes, Anita, I practised. <laughs> um, and I love them so much and I feel very, very lucky that my novel has been considered alongside yours. Uh, a few years ago now, Michael Hayward at Text Publishing saw an obscure idea that I had about a trilogy of novels about the Ferno Islands. And I'll always be grateful for that gesture of faith. To my editor, Mandy Brett, um, thank you for the thousands of decisions, large and small, that made The Burning Island a better novel than the one I had inside my head. 
Um, thank you also to Chong Wing Ho, to Jane Watkins, and to all of the texters for everything you've done for this book and for me. Uh, and I need to say the biggest thank you of all to my wife, Lily, and my children for putting up with my diva ways and my very weird hours. Um, I'm not a historian. I, I'm a fiction writer who happened to wander in this direction for a little while. And along the way, I found a wealth of extraordinary writers who are shaping our understanding of the past in real time. Um, the historians, people like Grace Carskins and Tom Griffiths and Cassandra Pybus and Mark McKenna. The storytellers like Kate Grenville and Kim Scott, Alexis Wright and Richard Flanagan. And of course, last year's winner of this very award, Mirandi Rio. There are, of course, so many other people um, involved, too many to name, in fact. I feel unworthy of all of their company, to be quite honest. Um, but given what passes for historical debate in this country at times, thank God they're all out there. I do think we're in the midst of a great revisiting of our history um, and good things may yet come out of that. Many thanks once again to Edward Federman and to the ARA group. And um, I'm looking forward very much to hearing who's the winner of the children and young adults category. Thanks. Thanks, Jock. And congratulations again, really well done. I, I read The Burning Island and I thought it was a terrific novel. I've already purchased Preservation, the predecessor novel to Burning Island. I can't wait to read that. I was particularly keen to introduce the CYA category this year to foster a love of the genre among younger readers. My nine-year-old granddaughter and I read many terrific novels together. And to see the firsthand love of reading in a young person and the creativity reading brings to a young child reinforce the decision to add the CYA category to the ARA Historical Novel Prize. It is my great pleasure to announce the winner of the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize CYA category. And this year's winner is Katrina Nanestead, whose novel, We Are Wolves, was published by HarperCollins Australia. Well done, Katrina. Congratulations. My granddaughter and I are reading your novel just now, and I can say with firsthand knowledge, it is a wonderful historical novel that is introducing children to a very difficult time in our history. So Katrina, here is the virtual presentation of your trophy as well. I'll now hand over to Paul McDonald, the chair of the children and young adult judging panel to give the judges report. Thanks, Edward. And can I say thank you to Elizabeth and the whole team. Um, as judges, I know a lot of the fellow judges have judged many, you know, many awards and, and this one was just beautifully streamlined. It's fantastic. So thank you to Elizabeth and the whole team. And thank you to, to Tuion and Catherine Mayo. We were very privileged to act as judges for this inaugural Children's and Young Adult Award category. And can I say, you know, it's challenging time. So we really relish the opportunity to just step out of the present um, and experience adventures, a whole range of adventures across time and space. Congratulations to everyone, particularly congratulations to Katrina Nanstead for winning with the novel Wear Wolves. Katrina transports, transports us back to East Prussia, the end of World War II. But like all good children's books, it's not just a book for, for young kids. It's not just a book for Edward's granddaughter. It's also a book for Edward. Um, the best children's books, like werewolves, are simple but layered, poetic and deeply moving. This is ultimately a tale about so many things. It's a tale about identity, family, trust, uh, survival. And what we loved ultimately, We Are Wolves, which is compelling and you know, heart, quite heartbreaking, but ultimately it, it's a tale of hope. And for that reason, we thought it was you know, a very worthy winner. So congratulations, Katrina. Congratulations to all shortlisted uh, authors, but congratulations particularly to Katrina for winning this inaugural award. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, Paul. I'm, I'm really honoured to win this award and I'm incredibly <laughs> excited. I've been excited since I was told and I'm incredibly excited still. So thank you. It's a great encouragement to me as I continue to write and especially as I continue to write historical fiction. Um, I'd really like to say congratulations to Amelia and Pamela, to my fellow shortlisters. 
Um, thanks to HNSA and ARA Group who sponsor this award, and especially to Edward Federman for his patronage. This is a, a really generous prize that, that really does make a, a, a huge difference in a writer's life. I want to thank the judges for your time, for your commitment, and for sharing your love of literature in such a generous way. There's so many books you've had to read, and I, I think that's a really generous way of sharing your time and your expertise. So thank you so much for that. Um, I really want to mention my illustrator of my novel, Martina Heidesek. She's done the cover art for my story, but has also enhanced my story with her beautiful internal illustrations. So I'd like to thank her for that. I'd like to thank my wonderful publisher, Tren Bing, and all the team at HarperCollins, and my lovely literary agent, Jane Novak. As a writer, um, it's just so special when you are surrounded by people who believe in you and believe in the work you're doing and also are happy to take a risk when you branch out and try something new. So I thank you to those people. Um, historical fiction really is powerful. It brings history alive in a way that is meaningful and accessible for our young readers. We really do want our children to be aware of the big events that have shaped their world. We want them to be curious and we want them to explore big issues. And we also want them to love literature. Historical fiction is the perfect medium for achieving all these things. So I'd like to finish by just thanking everyone here tonight um, who's watching even, not just here on the, the group of judges and um, shortlisted people, but everyone here tonight for celebrating historical fiction and for supporting the writers who create these stories. Thank you. I'd now like to hand over to Elizabeth. Congratulations, Katrina. One thing um, that really gave me joy in this is that um, even though we had to kind of organise this more formal video, I had the chance to tell both Jock and Katrina the good news. And Jock's jaw, I'm surprised it's still, you know, not on the floor. Um, and Katrina wept. So um, I was very moved by that. So that, that was wonderful. Congratulations to both of you. Uh, as Edward has mentioned, the prize recognizes and rewards the shortlisters in each category whose fine novels were so well regarded by the judging panels. Each will receive $5,000. The shortlisters in the adult category were Anita Heiss and Gail Jones. Unfortunately, Gail extends her apologies tonight as she cannot attend because of pressing family reasons. But I'd now like to call upon Anita to give her acceptance speech. Congratulations for the shortlisting of your wonderful book. Mandangu Elizabeth, Maranyaria everyone, Yindi Maradul, Mianjingul, Mangul. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good evening, everyone. I pay my respects to the traditional owners of country here in Mianjin, Brisbane, where I am tonight. A heartfelt thanks to Ed Pederman, the ARA Group, the HNSA, and judges for providing this extraordinary opportunity. Your commitment to raising the profile of historical fiction is incredible, and I am thrilled to have been shortlisted. Congratulations to you, Jock, uh, and congrats to Gail as well. I'm really humbled to be in your company. Thank you to my amazing publisher, Simon and Schuster, for pushing the boundaries with me in a space that still has some work to do. Thank you to my beautiful friend and my agent of many years, Tara Wynn, for going into bat for me every single day. As always, Yinjimara to my elders, my ancestors, my family, my Mia Gan. Uh, I will continue to write the truths of our history for as long as I have your blessings. I love you. Throwing it back to you now, Elizabeth. Thanks, Anita. Congratulations again. So our thoughts are very much with Gail Jones tonight. Um, Congratulations, Gail, if you're watching, <laughs> able to, on your achievement in being shortlisted. Um, I'm going to read her acceptance speech. I'm very sorry I cannot be with you tonight, but wish sincerely and emphatically to say how honoured I am to be included on the shortlist for the ARA Historical Novel Prize. 
with two riders of the caliber of Anita Heiss and Jock Sarong. This award is unusual in its generosity, flexibility and literary amplitude. Its definition of the historical novel is progressive and broad. It assumes that the task of imagining history is a radical form of knowledge. This award is unusual too in that it is the product of philanthropic largesse. I want to thank the ARA Group Ex Chair and Managing Director Edward Federman, who understands that ideas as well as objects are the vital stuff of social value and deserve support and encouragement. I extend my gratitude to ARA, the HNSA, and to all who have supported my work, the judges, the writing community, and especially my publisher's text. In this time of difficulty and strife, recognition of historical fiction reminds us that principles of hope and reclamation are embedded in narrative, that there are forms of feeling, knowing, and clarification offered to each of us singly and collectively in the inescapable experience of reading. Thank you once again. I'm humbled by this listing and warmly congratulate Anita and Jock. Thanks, Gail, for those lovely words. Now let's turn to the shortlisted authors for the inaugural children and young adult category, who are Amelia Mellor and Pamela Rushby, who've added a touch of magic, humor, and mystery into this contest. I really love those illustrated readings. So congratulations, Amelia and Pamela. Perhaps Amelia could speak first. Congratulations, Katrina. I'm so pleased to place in the new children's and YA category of the ARA Historical Novel Prize. When I was writing the grandest bookshop in the world as a broke student, I often worried that the fantasy elements that were integral to the themes of the work would mean that I wasn't taken seriously. <laughs> I'm thrilled at how many people have embraced the Cole family and their progressive book arcade as a shining light in Australian history. It's massively heartwarming to have your endorsement and support and to see my book brought to life tonight and to be counted amongst these five other hugely accomplished authors in our thriving industry is an honour. Thank you, Martin, Kieran, Meg, Tash, Laura, Coral, Rosie and everyone else who's bring, helped bring grandest to Australian kids and thank you. Ed. Elizabeth, Nicole, <laughs> and Paul, and everyone else who's been involved in the HNSA judging. My fellow shortlister, Pamela Rushby, it's your turn. Thank you, Amelia. Right. Look, I'm absolutely thrilled and also honoured to be included in the shortlist for the ARA Historical Novel Prize because it's truly wonderful to see historical writing being supported in this way and a great encouragement for writers of stories from history because I believe that the best, the strangest, the most riveting, heartbreaking, laugh out loud stories aren't fiction, they're real. They come from history, and I just love tripping over them and then writing about them. So many thanks to the ARA and the Historical Novel Society of Australasia for supporting and celebrating Australian historical writing. Thank you all to all the judges and to Walker Books, and a great big fair dink of new beauty for all the shortlisted writers. You're all rippers. Now back to Elizabeth for the closing remarks. Thanks, Pamela, and congratulations again. And thanks to all of you in Zoom land for joining us to celebrate the winner's announcement for the 2021 ARA Historical Novel Prize. So authors get ready to enter for 2022 and readers stand by to add more fabulous books to your reading lists. And everyone else, feel free to refresh your cocktails and toast to making a noise about historical fiction. Good night. Thank you.